Good evening, everybody. While everybody is finding a seat, I want to welcome you already. Great that you all made it through the snow to come here. Um, I'm Kirsten Kranz. I work at Sium Generale, and I'm really honored to introduce you to our new series for this year. It's uh, Winners, Losers, uh, as you can see. And, I mean, we live in an amazing society. We have everything we want, in a sense. We can choose any career. We can, you know, basically be successful. There's nothing to stop us. So if we fail, we did it to ourselves, you know? Like, you, there's no reason why you should fail, you know? Everybody can be a winner. That's kind of the general attitude that is there in society. And if, you know, people tell you that you're a loser, that's kind of full on, you know? Like, you don't want to be called that. And so people are kind of aware, you know, like you really want to, want to be a winner. And, a pe and it always comes to the same people, you know? Like it always seems that the successful people get even more successful, you know? And there's something that they always have all the luck, you know? How does that work? And actually, Ian Robertson can all tell us all about that. He wrote a book about it, The Winner Effect. And it's actually, yeah, as he will tell, it's sort of, uh, yeah, thing that enhances itself. It almost becomes like an addiction. Successful people just call it on themselves. So how can you turn from a loser into a winner? That's also a good question. I hope that we maybe get some practical cues. I don't know if you can give us that, but that would be nice as well. And then um, the next, next week, we also have a lecture about, uh, from a biological perspective. So winners, losers, because if you have winners, there, you know, automatically you also have to have losers in a society. So how does that work? And how is that, you know, from an evolutionary perspective, how do we end up in those different categories in that sense? And the last one is, is going to be in Dutch, so unfortunately for all the international people that don't speak Dutch, uh, it's The Machtloze Maakbaarheid by Paul Verhagen, based on his book Identity. But first, I will give the floor to Ian Robertson. He's a professor in psychology at the Trinity uh, College in Dublin. So, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. That's my limit of my Dutch. I'm going to start with a mystery. The mystery of the cichlid fish. The cichlid fish uh, is a small fish that comes in male and female, as most all animals do. Except there are two types of male. There's the T male at the bottom, the brightly colored bigger one, and there's the NT male and the top, not brightly colored, smaller. And these two types of males differ in a number of other ways. T male at the bottom is dominant, sexually fertile, aggressive, sexually attractive to female fish, whereas Mr. NT is submissive, infertile, uh, unattractive to females and skirts about at the bottom of the lake with the females trying to be avoid the tea fish. So any of you who have been in a nightclub in Holland? <laughs> <laughs> and I was one of the NT <laughs> males in the nightclub. So, however, there's hope, there's hope the anti males among you. Sometimes something remarkable happens. Sometimes Mr. T, Mr. NT, in a matter of less, a few hours, less than 24 hours, changes. He changes in every respect. He changes in size, he becomes bigger, he changes in color. He becomes brightly colored. He changes in behavior. He becomes aggressive. He changes in sexuality. He becomes sexually attractive. And he becomes fertile. The gonad-related neurons in his brain swell to ten times their size. How and why does this happen? That's the mystery. I won't solve it for a little while. Now, in today's 
biomedically dominated, genetically informed culture, there's a great tendency for us to feel that we're born to win. And in fact, this is the prevalent notion throughout much of the world. This is the whole basis of dowries, for instance, of paying very large dowries to marry your daughter off to someone who has the apparent requisites to, to give wealth. And uh, the royal families of Europe have tried to interbreed to maintain and create that success and breed that success. And um, more and more we are led to believe that our success in life is really genetically endowed, whether it be our IQ or intelligence or our personality, that some of us are biologically fitter than others. Many such people would greet the tea fish, and tea fish story with the accolade to say, look, that's how it should be for humans. Isn't it right that the biologically less fit should not reproduce? How many people have you heard say that there's a real problem from... I remember my old professor at London University, Hans Eisenk, saying there was a, in the newspapers there was a real problem of greater fertility in the lower classes and the lower IQ leading to a depression of the IQ of the... the the race of the nation because of breeding, more breeding among people with genetically endowed lower IQ. This, this is the territory we are in here. And there isn't, while the, the kind of notions of genetic IQ is, are still very prevalent, the whole notion of born to win is, is, is quite dominant. And, and so we have the universities of the world, the more and more, particularly in the, in the United States, but not only in the United States, we have the cultivation of elite universities where these, the born-to-win people go and to them get even more success and then you get this separation, this growing inequality of achievement. And some people would say this is a genetic and biological inevitability. So I just want to add a cautionary note there. This is Paul Paolo, who was Pablo Picasso's son. And this was Paul as Harlequin. Pablo Picasso painted him many times. Um, Pablo Picasso painted his children when they were young, but very seldom when they became adolescents or older. And um, poor Paolo had a very undistinguished life, which, if you like, goes against a, a kind of simple ver simple-minded version of the born-to-win notion, because his father was probably the best artist that had lived for a hundred years. Huge success, hugely rich, yet his, his son died in his 50s, an alcoholic. His own son, uh, Pablito, who was, killed himself a couple of days after his grandfather's funeral. Um, his, he, he, he was, drank too much. His family was in social services, care. How can you have such manifest Lack of success among the son of someone so successful. Well, it's not too surprising when you read a quote from Marina Picasso, who was um, <clears throat> Picasso's daughter by one of his marriages. And um, Marina uh, overheard uh, Pablo her father say, her grandfather say to her, his son, Paolo, the following, you're incapable of looking after your children. You're incapable of making a living. You're mediocre and will always be mediocre. You're wasting my time. I am El Rey, the king, and you are my thing. This is just one example. Pablo Picasso saw himself as El Rey, the king. His staff called him the son, and he, like very many highly successful people, saw himself as somehow so special that his qualities and his attributes were somehow unique and God-given. 
So that brings us on to a psychological concept which might help explain why it is very difficult to be the son or daughter of a very successful parent. And this comes from a, a social psychologist called Carol Dweck, who's in Stanford University. And she's argued that there are, we all have mental models of our attributes. And these fall into two broad main categories. Entity theories versus incremental theories. So an entity theory, um, for instance, if you think of this statement, people have more or less fixed quota of intelligence and can't change it much. I won't ask you to put up your hands, but mentally put up your hand <laughs> if you agree with that. Is your intelligence something you're basically born with? Or is it something you can, that's a product of your efforts and your interaction with the environment and your teaching and your education? Is it a thing or is it a process? Now it turns out that it matters a lot which of these you believe. For instance, American children age 13 going into the high school maths program when you measure their progress over 18 months in maths, irrespective of their starting level, their progress is much greater if they hold a, a, a process theory of their intelligence than if they hold an incremental theory. Sorry, than if they hold an in, entity theory. If you believe your intelligence is a thing, then... And the way that happens, for instance, is by your parents telling you, you're really clever, you're really bright, as opposed to your parents telling you, you did really well, you worked really hard at that, or that was really great, you overcame that problem. That would, these would be typical attitudes fostering pro, um, incremental theories or process theories of intelligence versus, you know... Jean's really smart. She's got a really high IQ. It's an awful thing to say to a child. Do you know why? Because if you believe, if you hold a mental model that you have this thing called intelligence, and then you fail an exam, or you fail to solve a problem, that becomes a threat to your ego. That becomes a threat to your self-concept. And the reaction may be, <gasps> maybe I'm not smart after all. If you hold a process or an incremental theory and you fail that exam or you fail to solve that problem, the response is, ooh, I wasn't trying hard enough or that was a very unfair or difficult problem or I'll need to work more at that. And it's less of a threat. And you can see this in EEG brain recordings of children who are solving problems, children who hold an entity theory, if they uh, are told they get a wrong answer, their brain shows a much more dramatic uh, response in the front part of the brain called the P300, P3A, which is a kind of, <gasps> what on earth was that response? And then when you give them the correct answer and say, I know the answer is this, the children with the incremental or process theory, they, their, their memory center shows a big spike as they register the correct answer. Whereas the entity theory people, their brain is so busy dealing with this challenge to their ego that they don't show the, 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 the memory encoding. And as a result, their memory for the test is worse than those who hold the process theory. So it matters what model you hold in your mind about the origins of your success or failure. It happens with personality as well. Children, Carol Dweck has shown children who, have, who are rejected by a, a social group in school who hold an entity theory of their personality 
are more likely to withdraw and suffer further isolation because it confirms the rejection, confirms a model they have which is not changeable, which is an entity theory. Whereas the children that hold a process theory of personality, my personality arises from a, you know, a combination of my attributes with my interactions and my effort. For them, they, they, they find another group. It's not such a challenge. Um, so uh, the theory you hold about your success or failure is very important in how you deal with that. Because what makes a winner? What makes a winner? Of course talent makes a winner. Mozart had talent, musical talent. Uh, Hussein Bolt had ath has athletic talent. <coughs> Einstein had mathematical talent. But in success, there are many Hussein Bolts throughout the world with the physical characteristics of Hussein Bolt. There are many Mozarts with his potential throughout the world. There are many uh, Einsteins waiting to, for the opportunities. But the fact is that without the confidence, without someone with faith in you, without the confidence to try and to engage in the practice, of these talents, you won't develop them. And practice, it takes 10,000 hours of practice to make a genius. <laughs> I'm not saying that if you take, you could give me 10,000 hours of athletic practice and I would not make a Hussein Bolt. But without 10,000 hours of practice, Hussein Bolt does not become Hussein Bolt. Mozart does not become Mozart. And the size of these fonts illustrate the importance of them. Persisting through failure. And this is where the entity theory comes. If you cannot persist through failure, then you will, and, and there's always going to be failure in any learning, in any progression through life, in any progress towards success. If you give up, which you're more likely to do if you hold an entity theory of your abilities, then you will not persist through failure and you will not engage in the learning that will help you develop the success. <laughs> if I hear some wealthy businessman or woman again pontificating about how wonderful and talented and clever they were to get to the point of being a millionaire I will throw up. <laughs> because for every one such businessman or woman, there are a thousand equally hardworking, equally talented, uh, equally creative business people who for random circumstances and random reasons did not make it. Because the, their business, it was their, the idea just didn't, make it at the right time. The market just wasn't right at the right time. The, all the random circumstances that make it the case that success is a huge portion of it is luck. And that's true for Picasso. It's true for Mozart. It's true for Hussein Bolt. Hussein Bolt needed a trainer and he was lucky in Jamaica. There are more of these than there are. He needed someone who spotted his talent and who developed it. That was luck. He needed a family that wasn't sending him out to earn money so he couldn't practice. Mozart has a father who had him here. Mozart and his sister practicing from age three or four and sending him to Italy when he was seven or eight. That's luck that you have a parents that are willing to do that and don't sit drinking whiskey all night. Um, and, and then there's the luck that they happened to find the, the sponsors in the 18th century to find the patrons who were willing to, 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 to allow him. There's plenty of Mozarts <laughs> that we maybe, maybe, maybe who, who never, because, never developed because they couldn't get the patrons. So, so luck is an enormous part in success. And that's important because of a phenomenon called hiding the ladder. And... Uh, this was a concept devised by a psychologist called Fiona Doherty in Dublin. 
Now, what does hiding the ladder means? Well, think of Pablo Picasso. He was El Rey. Staff called him the sun. He did what many very, very successful people do. They, they move to a position that they feel divinely gifted or divinely inspired or maybe even a bit divine themselves. It's not enough for them. They don't want to believe that luck practice persisting through failure played a part in their success because that subtracts from their greatness in their eyes. This is the problem of the ego. And imagine having a father or a mother who believes himself to be the God. As a child, how can you... This is divine intervention. This is not luck, persistence. <laughs> the ladder is hidden. The ladder of success is hidden because your father is great. He is El Rey. And that's a problem for my... This is my wife. who was a clinical psychologist. And for years, when we were in Cambridge, um, she would remark to me, she would tell me about the, the offspring of very successful parents, academics in Cambridge, whose lives were the opposite of their parents. They were a bit of a disaster, many of them. Not all of them, but many, some of them. And, and she always made a point of getting my children to take the mickey out of me. Not that I was a Nobel Prize winner, but I was reasonably successful. She wanted to make sure that I didn't put myself in a pedestal, and more importantly, that my children didn't put me on this pedestal of, of unattainable success where the ladder was hidden. And um, this, unfortunately, is, you know, Paolo Picasso actually was very... He liked to paint and to draw. And who knows, Pablo Picasso's father, his father's father, was an art teacher and used to encourage and get Pablo to encourage his drawing and foster and, 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 and encourage him and get him to practice and practice and practice. Not that I'm saying he would, he would necessarily have been a genius, um, uh, that that's the cause of his genius. But I'm just saying the contrast between the two fathers and the success is, is quite... Uh, Impressive. So success depends on the model you hold in your own mind of what causes your, your abilities. But also that is linked to what your parents convey to you about their success. Now, a lot... Success often brings power with it. Even if it's the success of celebrity or the success of um, business or the success of politics, power, which is defined as controlling resources or things that other people want or fear. So if I have the power to award 10,000 euro to 12 people in here, that gives me enormous power over you as an audience. If I have the, um, the power to pick 10 of you and give you electric shocks and lock you up for a week, that gives me power over you as well. That's the power of fear. So power is having control of other, other people's resources. But you also have power if you're a university uh, tutor marking someone's assignments. You have power if you sit in an interview panel to give someone a job. Uh, you have power if you are uh, a popular person in a school playground. Uh, you have power by virtue of your popularity over other less popular people. So power um, is a really important. And Bertram Russell, the great English philosopher, said... The fundamental concept in social science is power in the same sense in which energy is the fundamental concept in physics. He regarded it as the fundamental element or process or, or substance in terms of human relationships. 
Now, um, I want you to just do a little mental exercise. Can you think of someone you know who uh, was in some kind of boss position um, and who was changed and whom that power went to their head and changed them? Maybe your boss or someone else's boss or someone you know. Can you think, hands up if you can think of someone who was changed by power. Yeah, yeah. Every audience I've spoken to, at least half the people can think of that. Now, so I want you to think of that person. And I want you to think, ask yourself, do these attributes apply to that person? Did they become pushy? Did they become more selfish? Did they start to enjoy having an impact on people by shocking them or surprising them or frightening them or even by making them grateful by giving them favors or gifts? Did they start, appear to start to see others in terms of their usefulness to them? Did they seem to develop a kind of tunnel vision? And did they become sexually primed? Um, hands up if, if, if one or more of these attributes was, you, you recognize that in the people. Could you hands up in the people you're thinking of? Yeah, yeah. So here are some more characteristics. Did they seem to become hypocritical, applying different standards to themselves compared to others? And um, did they start seem to have difficulty in seeing things from other people's points of view? Um, did they become disinhibited, making insensitive or comments that seemed to them were jokey but actually were actually insensitive and hurtful? And did they become incompetent and bullying? Now, if I can just say that all of these sets of characteristics are documented effects of even small amounts of power on the human brain. Having power changes people, some more than others. It makes them more self-centered. It makes them more egocentric, less able to see someone else's points of view. It makes them more focused on their own goals and therefore more neglectful of other people's goals and therefore less sensitive. And there's a particularly worrying combination. If someone who is a boss feels inadequate in that role and has power, they're much more likely to be bullying and aggressive to their underlings. And that's a problem for business and all organizations because we know the Peter principle, the risk that you're promoted to your level of incompetence. You're, people get promoted to a level where they really can and that's, that's not scientifically verified, but it does happen. And people who feel inadequate in a job, who are maybe, maybe made a manager when they don't feel confident or don't feel they can do that job, they're much more likely, if they have power, to abuse that power by aggression. However, it's not all negative. Think of that boss. Can you think of leaders or bosses who seem to have responded to power by developing a strategic vision, by seeming to be able to see the wood for the trees better, or who become more decisive and goal-focused, who seem to develop a healthy appetite for risk, who seem to handle stress better, who seem to become sharper and smarter, more upbeat, more confident, more inspiring. Well, these are all symptoms of power as well. Because power affects your emotional state. And power evolved, our response to power evolved because we need these characteristics in leaders. We cannot afford to have leaders who are overstressed out by the job to the point that they can't perform. And actually, the effects of power, which I'm going to explain to you in a moment, 
um, are such as it acts like an antidepressant. It acts like an anti-anxiety drug. It acts like an attention changer so you become better able to see goals and to focus on goals and therefore to inspire others. It makes it harder for you to see risk <laughs> and to see danger. It makes you less worried. And um, it, it makes you decisive because you're more confident in yourself. It also makes you smarter. It makes you think more abstractly. You don't want a general in the Second World War who is too empathic for his soldiers because he has to have the big vision. He cannot think of all these terrible deaths. Unfor we, ca we can't have politicians who think about every uh, bad thing that happens to every individual from the policy decisions they make. So these are the positive sides of leadership. So power is a drug as powerful as cocaine and it has good and bad effects. Now, here we have Mr. Barclay, who was head of Barclays Bank in uh, the UK. And he, um, he said in an, inter an interview, culture is the critical element of responsible banking and the best test of it is how people behave um, while watching, while no one is watching. Uh, that was him in the, August 2011. Um, then a report came out by the governor of the Bank of England saying excessive compensation, shoddy treatment of customers, mis-selling and the deceitful manipulation of a key interest rate flourished in the banking sector. And he had to resign because he, he was not doing, practicing what he was preaching. Uh, here was the Treasury Select Committee of the United Kingdom pa Parliament. Mr. Diamond's evidence, at times highly selective, fell well short of the standard that Parliament expects, particularly from such an experienced and senior witness. So here we have someone with enormous financial power who was a key player prior to the 2008 collapse who, uh, who showed hypocrisy, which is one of the features of power, who shows, showed lack of appreciation of risk, who showed um, a rather greedy goal focus on enormous bonuses and enormous pr profits. All symptoms of power. Here's another one, um, Fred Goodwin, um, who, who you, 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 Netherlands, was very fortunate that he was so um, affected by power that he bought ABN AMRO, <laughs> which was a a disaster, a financial disaster, and took it off Dutch hands and, and thereby almost broke the British government because of the 80 billion in, in liabilities that ABN AMRO had at that time. And um, so here was a quote from uh, before, this was, this was before uh, Fred Goodwin's disgrace. Uh, some of our investors think Sir Fred is a megalomaniac cares more about size than shareholder val uh, value. This was in the context of him buying ABN AMRO. And um, it, was, it was though we, he was saying the emperor has no clothes. We all knew that, but no one dared to say it. Uh, an anonymous a board, member of the RBS board. So uh, here we have someone else who was carried away by power to the point that he made ludicrous decisions. And unfortunately had a board who were so uh, uh, affected by the dominance of this power, very powerful individual, that they, their judgment was completely inhibited. So um, let's turn to more cheerful things. Um, not that Chelsea beating Bayern Munich is necessarily cheerful, but um, this was a European championship when Chelsea beat Bayern Munich. Note the pose of the Chelsea players, okay? And note the pose of the Bayern Munich players. Oh, that was a very sympathetic female ah there. The males, the males among us wouldn't have gone mad. That was very emphatic. That was very good. Um, now, these are primitive responses to submission and dominance. These are apparent in all mammals that the dominant animal occupies space and adopts a posture that conveys 
spatial dominance, whereas submission is, creates a contracted, spati spatially contracted posture. And uh, here we see a similar posture in poor old Roberto Baggio. Mi dispiace quando si sono italiani qui. This was um, this is the Brazil Italian final of the World Cup in Pasadena, and Roberto Baggio had just missed the last the penalty shootout. And look at the Brazil f um, players, and look at Roberto Baggio. Now there was a wonderful experiment done by a group of American researchers in Atlanta, Georgia, because there was about 200 million people watching this match, and they went into a a couple of bar, a sports bar and a pizzeria in Atlanta, Georgia. They got a bunch of Italian fans in the pizzeria and a bunch of Brazilians in the sports bar. And before the match, they were all excited, so they took saliva samples. Um, and they went after the match and they took saliva samples. Now, they had to chase the Italians into the car park to get them because they were so dismayed at having lost but what they found was they measured testosterone in the saliva. And the the, these are just the fans. The testosterone levels of the Brazilian fans had shot up. Think of 100 million Brazilians, testosterone increasing. <laughs> this, is why economies, this is why economies grow with sporting success. <laughs> Think of... 60 million Italians, the <laughs> testosterone went down. This is the biggest pharmacological experiment in history. So we, testosterone went up, the testosterone went down. Now, I want people in this half of the room <clears throat> to adopt the CEO pose, okay? one of these poses. You occupy space. From, okay? Just adopt a pose. Okay? <coughs> right. <clears throat> this side of the room, junior accountants. <laughs> junior accountants in seeing the CEO. Okay? Just keep that for a minute. There's a wonderful researcher called Susan Carney. Um, Tricked, tricked people into adopting these poses that you're keeping just now by saying it was to do with measuring blood pressure and they got them to adopt expansive poses or contracted poses for just a minute. I took saliva pre-post and found you lot, your testosterone has gone up <laughs> and you lot, your testosterone has gone down. Men and women. Because women have testosterone too, less of it. But you lot, your testosterone has been, has been de de decreased by your posture. You lot, your testosterone has been increased. These are primitive dominance signals. Which lead to one of the tips you can go away with tonight. When you're next going in for a job interview or you're next having to face a difficult conversation... Fake it. <laughs> Fake it. Now, just a warning. If you're going in to see the CEO and you're wanting, or, or the, your boss, you have to be caref careful it doesn't become too much of a challenge. But the, the evidence is, if you get people, no matter how they feel internally, if you get them to adopt the external trappings of confidence and dominance, they'll be more likely to get a job in an interview situation. This, these silly peripheral aspects of posture change you bi bi biologically and biochemically. Um, and we know that in the city of London, and this was, this was the year before the crash, um, they measured the testosterone levels of traders in the city of London, this was John Coates and his colleagues in Cambridge, and found on days when their testosterone levels were higher, they made significantly more profits trading on the German bunds that day. So testosterone, 
This was done on males, but most of these findings apply to males and females. Now, talking about testosterone, Mike Tyson um, came out of prison having served three years for rape. And he had been world champion. He no longer was. Frank Bruno was world champion. So what, what does Don King, who was his manager, what do you do when you have someone who has failed, if you, if you like, in that way? How do you make him a success again? What's the answer? The Americans have a word for it. Tomato cans. Now, what's a tomato can? That's a tomato can. That's Peter McNeely, Jr. He was the first guy, Boston Irishman, he was the first guy, a few months after he got out of prison, that Tyson was set up to fight. He finished him off in 89 seconds. It was a complete mismatch. This guy was well past it. But the boxing promoters knew from 100 years' experience that to get success, you had to contrive small successes. So they, you, you had, they had to get some wins. And so that, a few months later, that was what happened to Peter McNeely. A few months later, he was his second one, Buster Mathis Jr. Took him three rounds. Buster Mathis Jr. A few months later, Mike Tyson went on to take back the WBC Boxing Championship from Frank Bruno, demolished Frank Bruno. So how does this happen? What's the, what's the answer to it? The answer is the title of this lecture, The Winner Effect. The Winner Effect, a.k.a. tomato cans, Across all species, humans, mice, monkeys, across species, the probability of winning a fight against a strong opponent is increased by previous victories against weaker opponents. And they've known this, boxing promoters have known this for centuries. The reason is that winning when when um, Tyson beat Peter Minnelli Jr., he would experience a big rise in testosterone. Testosterone is a feature of all contests, even chess tournaments. If you measure testosterone before chess players in a chess tournament, the testosterone levels go way up prior to the tournament, and the more they go up, the more likely they are to win. It's part of our competitive spirit. And testosterone has a very important effect increases a chemical messenger in the brain called dopamine. And dopamine, all the effects of power that I mentioned earlier, making you smarter, making you more goal-focused, making you less depressed, making you less anxious, making you more confident, all these are biological effects of increased dopamine affecting key areas of the brain, the reward network in the middle of the brain and the frontal lobes of the brain. So power and success act as mind-altering drugs that change our capacities and our emotions. And the biological research on this with the California mouse shows that winning against a weakened opponent, if you, if you, if you get the California mouse to fight against a, a drugged opponent, this mouse will be much more likely to win a subsequent match against a really tough opponent. And that happens because you've changed its brain. You've, okay, you've increased testosterone, but Mike Tyson's testosterone didn't stay high levels for month upon month after he beat Peter McNeely Jr. No, it went back down after the contest. But what had changed, if we believe the research on the California mouse was, that winning had increased the number of receptors in the brain receiving stations for testosterone. So that when he had the next match and his testosterone went up, it had a bigger effect on his brain because there were more receiving stations for it. And so 
and the receiving stations were in areas responsible for aggression and for motivation. And so winning changes our brains and makes us more up for the contest and more aggressive and motivated. This is part of the whole confidence package that's true for humans as well, almost certainly. And interestingly, however, some of us um, have a greater hunger for power than others. There's three basic motivations that human beings have for affiliation, that is to be liked by other people, for achievement, that is to achieve great goals, and for power, that is to have an impact or control over other people. Those who have a high need for the latter, a high power need, um, are much more likely when they win a contest to get a big surge of testosterone. Those with a low power need actually find winning, can find winning stressful. And they can have a rise of cortisol, the stress hormone, when they win. I don't have a great power need myself. And I lack the killer instinct in sport. I can be winning a tennis match and I can give it away at the end. It's all unconscious. These are all unconscious processes. But it's because I don't have that driving need to dominate, which is part of the power need. So how many of you can recognize either that you have or you know someone with the killer instinct can you think of someone who really has that? Put up your hand if you can think of examples of the killer instinct. Yeah. How many of you can think of examples of people who seem to lack that killer instinct that will somehow just lose it towards the end? Can you put up your hands if you can think of any? Yeah. Um, so this is a very fun, this is all unconscious processing. And it has to do with if you, have a, if you don't have a strong need to dominate and to have power, then the prospect of dominating and have power over another person can be anxiety anxiety increasing and can increase cortisol. And that sabotages, cortisol can sabotage your performance. So Henry Kissinger, great power monger, uh, he said famously, sex, power is an aphrodisiac. And here we have President Gaddafi's nurse. And... um, President Mugabe's young wife, and then we have, you know, the great Kim Il Sung. Here we have the whole panoply of power, where people, uh, you know, you become sexually very primed and active. And this is another feature of power, that it active, it works through the reward network of the brain, which is a, which is uses dopamine. And if you increase power, you increase dopamine activity in the reward network and you increase sexual appetite. So that's why power is an aphrodisiac, both for the power holder and for the people around them. It's usually a him, sometimes it's a she. So finally, I'm nearly nearly at the end here, but um, David Owen, who's a former uh, foreign secretary of the United Kingdom, he's also a doctor and um, a a, a neurologist, has proposed with um, a colleague in the States called Davidson a a diagnostic, set of diagnostic criteria for what he calls the hubris syndrome. That is for people, he has in mind mainly politicians, but this could equally be true of great, some great celebrities or some great business people um, of, of a set of characteristics. And here they are, some of his diagnostic criteria. A narcissistic propensity to see their world primarily as an arena in which to exercise power and their glory. A predisposition to take actions which seem likely to cast the individual in a good light, i.e. in order to enhance image. A disproportionate concern with image and presentation. A messianic manner of talking about current activities and a tendency to exaltation. Just think about it. Some of our great CEOs, <laughs> some of the great visionary leaders show these. And sometimes these can be seen in a, a, as good, inspiring things. And sometimes they are. This is the double-edged sword of power. It can so easily flip from an amazing capacity to inspire and lead into delusional uh, uh, misjudgment. Here are some of the other ones. 
and the identification with the nation or organization to the extent that the individual regards his or her outlook and interests as identical. Richard Nixon, the President of the United States, showed many of these characteristics, for instance. A tendency to speak in the third person or use the royal we. Excessive confidence in the individual's own judgment and contempt for the advice of criticism of others. Exaggerated self-belief bordering on a sense of omnipotence in what they personally can achieve. I spoke to Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, I suspect fell victim to the hubris syndrome, as does David Owen. And I spoke to um, a friend, who, friend of a friend who was a senior advisor to Tony Blair, who defended him completely, except at one point he said, yeah, that's, it's his certainty that bothers me. It's his certainty. Tony Blair was just so certain all the time. And in a complex world, no one can afford to be certain. But he did suffer from the Hubris symptom, syndrome. His brain had been changed by power. And he showed this exaggerated self-belief, this certainty. Incidentally, he and George Bush, Bush both believed that some of their actions were divinely inspired or and controlled as well. Uh, a belief that rather than being accountable to the mundane court of colleagues or public opinion, the court to which the answer is history or God. And Tony Blair, George Bush let it slip to one of the Palestinian leaders and, 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 and Tony Blair to the interviewer Michael Parkinson. It slipped out that God was playing a part in allowing him to push forward a, a very um, opposed view in, in going to war in Iraq. An unshakable belief that in court they will be vindicated. Finally, a loss of contact with reality often associated with progressive isolation. A uh, tendency to speak in the third voice, sorry, we already have that. Restlessness, recklessness and impulsiveness. An exaggerated self-belief bordering in a sense of omnipotence and what they personally can achieve. So an tendency to allow the broad vision about the moral rectitude of a proposed course to obviate the need to consider practicality, cost or outcomes. Now, uh, and, and, and finally, hubristic incompetence where things go wrong because of too much self-confidence has led the leader not to worry about the nuts and bolts of policy. These are unfortunately the downside of leadership and the effects of power on the brain. So anyway, I'm going to finish off. Why does Mr. N.T. turn into Mr. T? The mystery of the cichlid fish. Here's the answer. The downside of being a tea fish is in your lavishly multicolored presence, you're more visible in the shallow waters of Lake Tanganyika to gulls, and therefore you're more likely to be plucked away. The reason they're called tea fish is because they have territory. The reason they're called, the others are called anti fish is because they have no territory. The dominance goes with territory. So, a tea fish gets plucked from the water leaving a vacant territory. Lucky Mr. N.T. Fish is swimming about trying to avoid the tea fish. He goes, sees territory. <laughs> Takes the territory. Within less than 24 hours, he changes into a tea fish. Hence my optimism about my chances in the <laughs> nightclubs. Not that it ever happened, but I, I retain hope. So here we have uh, an established NT fish. This is the mean size of the gonad neurons in their brains, the critical ones for sexual fertility, aggression, coloring. And here's, here's over the course of one day, they transform. It takes less than 24 hours. The reverse can also sometimes happen that... Uh, a tea fish turns into an NT fish if by any chance they lose territory. So we get the similar, a parallel in human behavior. Winning an Oscar lengthens your life by an average of four years compared to being nominated for an Oscar. <laughs> That's equivalent to curing all cancers for all time. Let me just say, not try and explain this diagram. This is a PET scan of monkeys who are 
and they're looking at the dopamine levels in their reward network in their brain. And you're measuring their dopamine levels um, while they're individually housed. And then you're putting them into a group cage where quickly a dominance hierarchy evolves. Look what happens to the dominant monkeys. Their dopamine levels go up hugely. Um, they become dominant. And the subordinate ones, they uh, actually statistically decline slightly. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you then make cocaine available to these monkeys, the subordinate ones go for it much more, take much more of it than the dominant ones, because cocaine acts through the same centers of the brain as the power and dominance does. So, and I'm going to finish off with one slide. This is social status uh, in an American popular small uh, level of social status against pet measured dopamine levels in humans. <laughs> so we do get parallel effects in human beings. So that's why inequality, that's why Holland is a very good country uh, in, in some, many respects because of relative, and Scandinavian countries are for the relative lack of huge inequalities because inequalities perpetuate inequalities. You don't just get winner effects, you get loser effects as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. It was a very interesting question. I'm sure there's questions. Uh, Guus will walk around with the microphone, so just wait till the microphone gets you so everybody hears your question. Who has a question? Hands up if you have one. Not everybody at the same time. <laughs> um, thank you. Okay, so I wanted to ask about uh, the monkeys. So why do the most subordinate ones take more cocaine? Because you said the cocaine works uh, through the same receptors as power. So why don't the ones who have more power take more cocaine? Um, because the most, um, most, most neurotransmitters in the brain like dopamine and noradrenaline have an inverted U-shaped function where there's an optimal level, okay, where too much can be interfere with performance and too little. So the subordinate monkeys had, had too low levels of cocaine and the, sorry, of, of dopamine, and the cocaine <laughs> served to optimize that, to, 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 whereas the, the, the dominant, the dominant, um, monkeys had optimal levels because of their dominant status. They had optimal levels of dopamine yeah. and therefore the cocaine was less attractive because it had less uh, normalizing effects on their, on their dopamine levels. Oh, I see. So can you say then that, that it's like uh, substituting uh, one, subta one yes. substance for the yes. other? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any more questions? <laughs> yes, in uh, one of your first slides, you showed that uh, getting all that power, uh, you can go the, the right way or the, or the wrong way. Yeah. Uh, what determines whether you go left or right? A very good question. Um, well, there's, there's, let me say there's two main factors. The main factor is uh, constraints on power. I was watching yesterday Barack Obama being inaugurated for his second term with 700,000 people on the mall in Washington and adulation. Yet he looked back, someone said he looked back at the, the crowd 
as he was leaving because it was his last inauguration. He'd never see that again because he only has four years to go. That's in the Constitution. That is a critical constraint in a democracy. There's someone who, even, no matter how successful you are and how much power you have, your term is limited. Uh, so, democrat, so, so, so governance, democratic instruments like elections, a free press, and an independent judiciary were invented to combat the terrible biological effects of unfettered power on leaders' brains. And if you, the more constraints you have, for instance, good governance in organizations or business, so that people cannot wield whimsical or arbitrary power, that will curb the dopamine surges you will get each time because there's going to be a bit of anxiety there as well. Ooh, maybe if I bully this young office secretary, ooh, maybe I'll get in trouble. So you're not just getting the big dopamine surge of the dictator, you're getting a bit of anxiety and noradrenaline as well that's going to counteract that. So the, the addictive properties are, 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 are reduced, if you like, by these. The second factor is an individual one, people's need for power. And um, all politicians and all senior executives, by definition, have to have a high need for power. Who would want to be president of the United States? Hands up who would want to be president. There'll be a few. Hands up if you'd want to be president of the United States. Okay. Four people, three males, one female. Right. So you will age. You will age because it, lead, being a leader and be, is, is so stressful. It is incredibly stressful. And um, the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who's just incidentally been, re, been re-elected Prime Minister this year, but in 2008, famously resigned after only a year, causing chaos in the world markets for stress-related reasons. Um, you've got to, you, you need an appetite for power to be able to get its stress-reducing properties and to be able to see the wood for the trees. And in spite of the fact the economy is in a terrible state, in spite of the fact that People are moaning and frightened because they can't see a way through it. The great leader can see through it and can inspire, and that's what power does to you. So you need an appetite for power, but there's, that appetite comes in two forms. One is wanting, wanting to have power for the greater good of people, for the group. It's a so-called S power, social power. And the other is P power, wanting power for the egotistical qualities it gives, you know, for that, that sense of personal satisfaction of being able to wield power. Everyone has a bit of both. Women tend to have more... They, women have plenty P power, but they tend to, an average, of a bit more S power as well. And so we want our leaders to have a balance of P power and S power. If you have S power as well as P power, when you win, you will get a surge of testosterone, but it won't be as large or as long-lasting as if you are someone with an only P power uh, motivation. So uh, S, uh, having a social motivation, and teachers and nurses and doctors, for instance, have got a high need for power, but it tends to be a need for power that's S power driven. And S power makes it less likely that you become addicted to uh, or, or suffer the biological consequences of unfettered power. Uh, in the back. And there's a lady. There's a lady here as well. Next. Yeah. Well, um, you explain power as a social effect, but when I think of my... Of, of writers I admire, uh, they were seclusionists. They searched seclusion to go into the depths of their psyche to search for beauty, or they created so they created art, and they lived in seclusion. They weren't socially successful. How do you explain these, this capacity to create beauty, uh, which was mainly, I guess, created by people who searched 
who went into the opposite direction, not into society to search for power, but into an opposite direction. Yeah. What drove them? That's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, I mean, I, 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 there's plenty of fine artists who are very sociable. James, James Joyce, for instance, was very sociable about the bars of Trieste. Jack London. <laughs> Jack London too, yes. Um, but, but no, it's a good point. What, power is your relationship to other people. Power is wanting to dominate. Uh, and so doing something like writing or creating a great work of art in seclusion is a completely different motivation. That is, that is a motivation for achievement, not for power. And, and, and it, 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 it activates a completely different set of brain areas. It's, it's, it, I, I'm not sure, it's, it's probably almost certainly not as addictive, if you like, as the, um, the power motivation. But it's, it's, a, it, it's one of the three main motivations, power, achievement, and affiliation, um, which, uh, which, which motivates most people, and people have in different balances. Um, in, interestingly enough, the best managers are ones who have a, a high power and a high achievement motivation, but a relatively low affiliation motivation, um, because you have to do unpleasant things when you're in power, unfortunately. Is it? There we go. Hi, well, thank you very much. Ve Sorry, thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation. I do have a question, though, because you talk about power as really being some kind of <coughs> need to control others through yes. resources or by inducing fear. But how do you, what's your take then on um, power as a sense to be freed from the control that others can have over uh, you? So this need for autonomy. Yeah. So this would bring a whole new perspective on your story, right? And I'm asking this because many of the effects that you say that, uh, or the consequences of power, the behaviors that people display because they are powerful, are actually also behaviors that they display because they are autonomous. They're not being held accountable for their actions. So... Basically, what's your take on power as a need to be freed from the actions or control of others, rather than having the need to control others? I, I, I think it's, it's a factor. I think it's a factor in some people. I think it's a factor in some people. I don't think it can explain the, the basic biological phenomenon of, of, of dominance. Um, Social aspects of No, I would agree with you on that aspect, but maybe it's because you kind of go back and forth on treating power also as some kind of social phenomena, basically, as yeah. a, there's a dependency in the relationship between the power holder and the yeah. powerless. So, in that sense, then autonomy plays a role it's, as well. It's a, really, it's, a really good, um, it's a really good question, and there's no doubt about it that one motivation for p getting power in some people is the terror or the fear of being controlled by other people. And, to, and, and you, you'll often hear business people uh, who will say, look, I'm, I'm in business because I, I don't want to be under anyone else's control. That, that is a very strong motivation. Um, but and, and I say, if, if that is your motivation, then good. It won't, it's very unlikely to become distorting and addictive. Indeed, yes. So, so that's basically why I'm out. Yeah. yeah. So, but what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that explanation of the effects of power aren't enough to explain the hubris syndrome mm -hmm. and, to, and, and the bizarre changes in people's behavior that happens when they're given positions of power. So I think, but it, it is, a, I, I, there is, there is some research on this um, that, that in some situations that, you can explain some of the phenomenon in power by, by a, a desire to just free yourself or make sure you're not going to be under anyone else's control. Yeah. And I suspect there's a balance of motivations there that come into play. Yeah.
Yeah, okay, so, okay, this is satisfying. Can I ask one more little question? Uh, well, just... <laughs> well, let's go to another one, and if there's still time, then you can... Uh, here, in the front, oh. Uh, I would like to come back to uh, what you said about the CEO posture and uh, that it was equally helpful for men and women to, to uh, um, display this kind of behavior when you... So, uh, Can you talk in the microphone? Oh, sorry. Uh, I should say it again, maybe. Um, I can repeat the it. The yeah. CEO posture, that it is yeah. uh, beneficial when you are uh, opting for a job and that it's equally helpful for both men and women. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, because in the past, uh, two of us, we reviewed uh, research on non-verbal behavior and gender differences. And then it turns out that when women uh, display uh, dominant non-verbal behavior, that uh, it uh, elicits different reactions than when men do this. Because for women, it's very often mm -hmm. uh, sexually ambivalent. Uh, for men, it's more straightforward. Yeah, that's so interesting. Women, uh, it's not always uh, beneficial because it's yeah. interpreted in a different way. That's a really interesting point. Um, and you get a similar thing with color. Um, that uh, a phenomenon that wearing red across a number of species, including humans, can signal dominance and increase your chance of winning. For instance, in the Olympics, Greco-Roman wrestling and uh, boxing, you're randomly allocated red or blue shirts. And if you wear a red shirt, you're more likely to win statistically. It happens in soccer as well. For women to wear red, it's more complex because there's connotations of sexuality that can complicate the thing. The, the getting a job in posture, that was American research. There quite possibly are cultural differences here, so I completely accept that, that um, there could be situations where a dominant posture could actually be counterproductive uh, for a woman in the same way as wearing red into an interview or, or into a negotiations could be. Um, so, yeah. yeah. More questions? Oh, there was one. Oh, there is a one. Hi, um, my name is Hanneke Hoekstra and I'm a historian here at the university and uh, my question is from a historical angle um, and I sort of elaborate on the constraints that you bring up on, for example, um, Obama's quest for power. Um, early modern political theorists have found that, you know, that the, the main quest of all men was power and that uh, they also found that one of the constraints in early modern times was on the eternal warfare was the rise of capitalism. So they saw that greed or trade, if you like, was an important check on this, um, you know, insatiable quest for power. And the other passion, if you like, of man is, as you also indicated, is lust or sex. So also this brings in a, a gender question. How would you, for example, um, turning back to the picture of Obama uh, looking backwards on his shoulder, you know, uh, receiving his second term, how would you assess the impact of his wife on his quest for power? And do you think that the, the historical role change of women in political power leads has possibly some constraining effects, have yeah. had constraining effects upon male power behavior. Thank you. That was such an interesting, uh, interesting question. I hadn't heard the theory about the capitalism, uh, if you like, being a factor in the the eternal warfare that, and, and you know, Steven Pinker has written this book about the decline and violence in human beings. And uh, of course, many uh, major multinational CEOs and uh, bankers would have probably been warlords if they were in Afghanistan, but they can be warlords and, and can get their lust for power satisfied within the capitalist uh, system. So I, I agree with that. In terms of women, I, my impression of Obama, he has been affected by power. 
he, um, he, start, he started off being very upset when he ordered his first drone attacks eight days after he took the first, the first inauguration. And he heard that some children had been killed in his first drone attack, and he was really upset. Move forward three and a half years, and he's, he's at a Washington Press Association banquet. And there's a famous, the Jonas Brothers band in the audience. And he said, uh, boys, you know, and he's referring to his daughters, they really like you, but I've got one warning for you, predator drones. So he made a joke. He made a joke. And he has a meeting every week at which he decides which people will be targeted and killed by predator drones. But power had so dulled his empathy and, and you know, that, that he was... And, and dulled his sensitivity that he was able to joke about this. Nevertheless, my impression and his, his relationship with, with Michelle is that he really, he, she, she is part of the team very much. This is not, his ego is severely constrained by, and he's part of a, a collective ego rather than one big male ego, is my impression. And that she is probably if a very healthy uh, uh, dilution of that potentially uh, corrupting effect of power on the ego. In general, in my book, I do say at the end that um, we need many more women in positions of power um, uh, because I think they will become corrupted by it. And Margaret Thatcher, it went to her head in a big way. Um, but, but I do think we need the, the, the balance, the gender balance, and particularly in, the, in, in, the, not in industry as well, because men can get into this competitive ego warlord kind of mentality, and women are, are, can dilute that, would be my view. Yeah. But they have to be prepared to put up with the stress and to the aging that goes with stress. <coughs> So power corrupts, uh, but doesn't power uh, also attract the corruptible? Ah, yes. Very great question. Um, it does. There's no doubt about it that um, the uh, the evidence is that you're if you've if you've been uh, the, the 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 bad evidence, if you've suffered severe material deprivation in youth you're more likely to be financially corrupt if you get into a position of power, unfortunately. Your early deprivation, if you, similarly, if you've got emotional deprivation in youth and you get into a, a position of power, you're more likely to then emotionally abuse uh, your, your, your power. So, um, in, you know, in the same sense that people with... Um, the, the subordinate monkeys with the low dopamine levels are attracted to the cocaine... So, um, you know, low-status people, uh, that's why we have higher levels of cocaine use among the lower orders of society, the people of lower socioeconomic status. But if some of them, these people, manage to, to um, uh, get into positions of power, there are more risks, I guess, if you've had early deprivation. But we can think of many examples against that of... of, of, of um, uh, uh, Gandhi, now he was from a middle class background, but, but there are, there are counterexamples, but no corruption is, is something to which all of us uh, are exposed and we're all at risk no, no, one, no one is completely uh, uh, oblivious to it and early deprivation makes you more at risk uh, Thank you I had a question about um, that the effect the increase in territory has on the NT fish and whether the effect has, um, applies across all mammals or all animals. And if so, how that effect plays out on an international scale between not just countries, but also um, whether or not it um, has an effect on countries with a high population density with people having um, less actual space per person um, and countries where people have more space, like, suppose, between the Netherlands and Australia. <laughs> oh, well, well, um, 
Wow, this, um, I, I think that um, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I think the Netherlands is one of the most civilized and fine countries in the world with the highest population density, and um, and Netherlands is living proof against the by the nonsense of biological reductionist theories of human behavior because it shows that good civilization and social organization can override um, primitive biological factors and we should not be biological reductionists. We should recognize that the greatest determinants of our human biological functioning as human beings is civilization and history and governance, not um, unchangeable genetic uh, factors and primitive biological determinants like space per person. That's, that's, to me, these are not relevant to, to predicting human behavior. It's to do with the higher order um, artifacts of civilization, in my view. Last question. Thank you very much. Um, my question is, um, uh, right now, uh, in your um, lecture, you said about uh, uh, the changing uh, of, the, uh, of the person uh, by power. And uh, how, how is it, um, how can, uh, can we, for example, uh, effect, effective, um, conf confront, uh, confronting someone effectively uh, uh, with, uh, with this changing? Because if you're working in an uh, organization, yeah. for example, in a hard, uh, in the, you have the soft and the hard beta. And uh, in a hard beta, we are trying to get more women yeah. in a science. Uh, even the United Nations created funds, uh, women in science. And uh, we are trying to motivate, but it's really hard to get uh, more uh, women, and especially, especially girls, uh, in uh, hard battles in Holland. It is, you see the different situation in, for example, in Sweden, or in Norway, or in Italy, but it's, it's, it's another, completely another situation in Holland. And that's, that's why I'm trying to understand how can we, if, if, we, if we will see someone changing by power, how can I confront yeah, them uh, yeah. with, with this changing? You know, that's such a... To, yeah, yeah. to get open view. How do you, how do you, what do you do? You know, I, I've, I've, only, I've had that question a few times, and it's always a young woman that asks me that question. <laughs> uh, and we know why. Um, and and it, there's not an easy answer, because it depends on... It depends on the culture and governance of the institution you work within. It depends on the individual personalities. And so I could say to you, um, confront the person, but actually this is not, this is something that there's no easy answer for, unfortunately, for in any one situation. The only thing I would say is this. Power makes you inclined to see other people as objects and not to see them not to empathize with them and not to, to uh, see their indiv human individuality. And that's one reason why, to take an extreme example, in the concentration camps in, in Nazi Germany, um, the, you know, Primo Levi, the great Italian um, writer, said that the critical thing was you had to get the guards to see you, see you to, to get them out of the mindset that you were just an object and get them to see you as a an individual, an I, a person. So I would, uh, that's my only piece of advice, is that if you can try and override the, the power holder's tendency to just see you as someone who's a tool for his, and it's usually a he, not always, no, actually there's many women as well, but as, as, as a tool for these goals and to see you as an individual, um, that that would be, however you do that, would be one piece of advice, but it's a very, it's a very tricky one, and I, I, there's no general advice because you can end up getting yourself into a lot of trouble if you don't play the game. You know, that's the problem. Depends on the individual, depends on the organisation. Sorry, I can't give you a better example. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, for this lecture. I would like to give you a book by actually a professor at our university, David Reisma. Uh, disturbances of the mind. I think ah, <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.